All right. We are in the 13th week of our series. Did it seem like it went fast? 13 weeks goes by. I'm going to ask you to open to 1 Samuel this morning. I won't bother you with the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1 today. We're still talking about David. He was somebody's son. I've, of course, forgotten whose, but... <clears throat> Jesse's the son of Jesse. And we've talked a lot about David, and we've talked a lot about certain aspects of David's life, and they, and they run the whole spiritual gamut from sin to sanctification, um, to the power of his prophecies and his poetry. And we talked in passing, sort of, about the great epic point in David's life, which was, as a very young man, he dared to take on a giant that even the giants in his own, among his own countrymen did not dare to take on, and he did it by the power of faith. And we know so much about David, I thought we would go back and isolate some of the aspects of faith that David showed that day uh, in the battle with the Philistines. These things, the Apostle Paul said, are written for our, as examples to us and for our edification. There are lessons to be learned, and that's why we turn back to the Old Testament and to the great saints of that era. David, of course, lived some circa 1,000 years before Jesus Christ and 1,000 years before Abraham. He's right in the middle of the genealogy. I'm going to read to you the, the chapter. It's an, an awesome story. Um, and it's long, so let me get to it, and I hope it will excite you and uh, revive in you, if you haven't been there for a while, some of the way you felt when you first came to Christ and read stories like this. And so Samuel writes, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and and Azekah in Ephes Damin, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together. Saul is the king, the first king in Israel, just to remind us. And they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. I'm guessing that's a lot. He had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders, safe to say he's, we're in the Bronze Age. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. And he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself, and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we'll be your servants." But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. The man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of these three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. And Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brother an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves 
and run to your brothers at the camp. And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of, the, of, the, of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they, and all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, and took the things, and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array army against army, and David left his supplies in the hands of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. And as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, counting, or rather coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words, and so David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. I would have done it. And David spoke to the man who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Hallelujah. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. And when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth and he a man of God from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant David has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. He took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones, the famous five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went with him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David with his little fanny pack on, <laughs> he disdained him. For he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me 
and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. Probably the first prophecy David ever uttered. And this day I'll give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air. He's prophesying taking on the whole army. And the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give, it into your, he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David. David hurried and ran toward the enemy to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took, the, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now these men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Shearim, even to as far as Gath and Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. The king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I'm the son of your servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. <coughs> Father, we ask that you would bless us with the principles of faith that are taught here in your holy word and by your servant David. And we pray in Jesus' name yet again, O oh Lord. So there it is. You would think by this time the Israelites would learn that faith overcomes giants. And when you were afraid of giants, if they ever read the book of Numbers... You end up staying in the promised land for 40 years if you give a bad report about the giants. I suggest to you, David read that book. And he wasn't about to let his people go another 40 years into obscurity. So we have this great story, friends. You ever played a stock market? I'm a big stock investor, big hedge fund manager. The stock market has the bear and the bull. You know about the bear and the bull, right? Political parties have the donkey and the elephant. Do you know that? But all conquering faith in God has the lion and the bear, and this is the story of it. The lion and the bear. Now, we talk about the power of faith. We discuss it. The faith to hold on to God's vision for our lives. You know, there's a danger in talking about faith today. I hear so many preachers get it so wrong and give so much false confidence to people. Friends, faith is not just positive thinking. So please get that out of your head. It, sometimes it's very realistic thinking. But it's a thinking, if it's positive, it's based on a rich history of answered prayer with God intervening in your life in other challenging ways. And you're relying on that. Friends, God saved you. I don't know. We're all different lengths of time. Me, it's about 30 years. Or, no, it's like 
almost 40 years, <laughs> 38 years. So I've lived longer in the Lord than I lived in the devil before the Lord. And um, my faith, it's my faith that took me along. There were a lot of trials along the way. What your faith teaches you is that all problems are theological. Friends, I, I want to I wanna tell you something different than a lot of faith preachers teach today. Faith doesn't mean you get what you want. Faith means whatever you get, you still love God and do all things to his glory. That's what faith means. If you watch what David did here, he didn't just have faith to kill the guy. He had faith to kill the, the, the guy, the voice, that was defying the armies of Israel and Israel's God. And Goliath made a great mistake. He thought they were there to fight for Saul, and you know what they were until David showed up and realized and made them realize they were there to fight for God. God had given them this land. It was their land. So we talk about the power of faith, the, the faith to hold on to God's vision for our lives. God saved you any number of years ago, as I've said, right? But he obviously saved you for something. And if you haven't found out what it is yet, well, that's part of why we come to church on Sunday, because we have a, we have a schedule in, in, in Christ of one day in seven to come before him and worship him. I mean, even Goliath worshipped his god, Dagon. If you read other passages, you might remember Dagon. The statue fell down and broke. Um, god saved you for something. David knew that. David knew. David's trials were secret. Nobody knew about the lion and the bear. He had to tell them. Here's Eliab, the big older brother, coming up to the young, the baby of the family and complaining to him. Little did he know that David could have whipped his butt. Sorry to be so crude, but I wonder if he came up to him after he took the giant down. So our faith is to continue under unbearable pressures. That's what it's for. The faith to overcome disappointments. Friends, life is full of disappointments. It's the faith to turn trial and tragedy into character and accomplishment. Faith should stabilize our lives, not make us weird fringe people. We are weird fringe people, but I think we shouldn't be any weirder or fringe than we have to be according to our faith. So this chapter is one of the great passages in the scriptures on, over, on over, the overcoming power of faith. Faith in God stands strong in the moment of trial. But it takes practice. It takes history. David is trying to teach that to Saul and the Israel in this episode. Oh, you're a young man. You can't go up against him. But you don't understand what I've been through. The story of David and Goliath offers us some very clear principles of perseverance and deliverance from evil and from destruction, and in some cases, even from death. Although eventually we all, like David, die. So be confident in your history of deliverances. Walk by faith, not by sight. I'm afraid of that verse. It can become a cliche so quickly and be meaningless. Because it's faith in something. Faith is only as good as the object of your faith. Walk by faith in God, not by human sight. Number three, confront obstacles as they come. And, and confront them head on. Number four, use the tools God's already provided you. He's already given you some things. I'm going to illustrate all of these principles to you this morning. Don't believe the reports of the enemy. Don't believe the reports of the enemy. I'm going to deliver your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Um, you're the enemy. I don't really trust your prognostication. Number six, be skeptical of worldly things and worldly devices. He didn't need the conventional device, the sword. 
In fact, a sword would have done him no good, right? I mean, take the faith out of it. I mean, a little guy against a big guy and a sword. You saw how big his sword was like a weaver's beam. He had another guy carrying his shield for him. If you ask me, Goliath might have been weighed down too much. So number one, be confident in your history, your personal, rich history of deliverance. Verses 36 and 37 illustrate the point very nicely. Samuel writes, quoting David, Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And, is, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Now, those of you that are against the killing of animals, I'm going to ask you to leave for this section. Moreover, David said, The Lord who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear... He will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Friends, it has been observed that most people who die in the wilderness, stranded, die of panic. Have you ever heard that? You die of panic. You've been there one day, say the plane went down, and you're okay, you look around, and you're all ready to die. <laughs> before you try. People die of panic. And it's understandable. It's understandable. They become so overwhelmed by considering what might be. Friends, imaginations can toy with our minds. They become so overwhelmed with considering the future. Friends, I'm going to tell you one thing that can destroy faith is thinking it to death. Thinking has less power than you might think. Now, there's obviously some that you have to do. But they become so overwhelmed by considering the future and what might happen, they don't stop to recognize the resources available to them at that moment. To last one more day may bring deliverance. How often have I said to you, I see so many people quit just before their deliverance. Just before their blessing comes, they stop praying for it. They stop walking for God. Don't let your faith die of panic. Due to unseen circumstances or seemingly overwhelming odds. Notice I said seemingly. There are no overwhelming odds for God's people. The end is written. If David died, it would just be another story of faith with another lesson. But this is the lesson he gave us. Trial and hardship ought not to overtake us unawares as a thief in the night. You know, I've, I've tried in my Christian life not to let sins of good people surprise me. And yet still they do. Sometimes I'm like, you did what? You've been in the Lord how long and you did that? So it does still surprise me. Um, and I try not to let the next hardship surprise me. Life's hard. That's why I, I'm a very big believer in rejoicing. I think we should rejoice. I think we should eat and drink and be happy with the blessing God gives us because it's only for that moment. And the next day, even later that day, could bring trial and hardship. But we are rejoicers. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul said. It's a command. Christians are rejoicers. Let's rejoice. No matter what we have, let's learn to rejoice. And don't be surprised when trials come. Don't say, why me? Be glad it's not someone more deserving. In this world, you'll have tribulation. It's a promise from Christ. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Peter said it this way, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened. Trials aren't strange. They come, and there they are. And we've all had them. And we had a long prayer session this morning about uh, each other's trials. Because they ought to be important to each other. Don't think it's strange when they come upon you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. 
Easier said than done, but that's the directive. That's the goal. Let's not forget the warning of James. He said, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I read from that in my prayer this morning. Knowing that test, the testing of your faith produces patience. The trial is fixing something in you that needs fixing. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be full and complete, lacking nothing. I believe that so far as faith and trial is concerned, David at that moment was full and complete, lacking nothing. He did not so much as stop to consider that God had saved him from the lion and the bear to become fodder for this Philistine. He never thought for a minute, God saved me over here so I could come out here and be beaten down by this loud mouth. In fact, the lion and the bear were the very trials that prepared him for this day. We said last week that trials ought not to dampen or weaken or discourage faith. Rather, what do they do? They mold it. They mold faith. Faith isn't a quantitative thing. It's a qualitative thing. We don't, we, I know we pray for more faith. Give me more faith, more, more, more. Jesus said, if you have faith, it's a mustard seed. And he said that because it's a very small thing, right? If they had atomic sciences, then he would have said, have faith as a molecule or faith as an atom. I mean, those words were already coined three centuries earlier by Democritus, just a little point of history. But he said mustard seed because he's in an agricultural society. He gave an agricultural illustration of a very small, tiny thing. It isn't about more faith. It's about how you use the faith you have. We all have a measure of faith given by God, but it's, it's the quality of the faith that will matter. And trials improve the quality of our faith. And we come out the other end. Look at Jacob. We just talked about Jacob wrestling, right? He came out afflicted. He came out crippled. He came out limping. So much so they never ate that part of the lamb again. The, the, the muscle that shrank, right? But faith molds us. It sharpens faith. It directs it for God's glory. The lion and the bear aren't even talked about by David as great trials. They're just talked about as training ground. Friends, if a lion came after you today, I think you'd think, I'm in a trial. <laughs> right? A bear? We were talking about that with some friends the other night. They confronted a bear on the road. And we had the discussion. One of these girls is physically fit. She jogs everywhere, right? And the question came up, would you, when you're jogging through a remote area, would you rather come upon a man or a lion? <laughs> A man or a bear, they said. And she said, I'll take the bear any day. You, you, you know, you don't see a lot of that in the media today. The bear, you have a chance of scaring away. The man's there for a reason. Um, that's where we are in our society today. Women rather see a bear than a man. Uh, I don't know. I guess bears aren't afflicted with toxic masculinity. <laughs> Friends, admittedly, David was exercising a childlike faith, wasn't he? He didn't question a lot of things. He just ran toward the danger. Eventually, sin and time and circumstance would dampen his faith as he approached into adult, adulthood. He'd go off and on. Problems get more complicated. Faith gets more difficult to hone and direct. But I think it's because David neglected his faith, neglected his spiritual disciplines, like praying and singing psalms and worshiping God on the Lord's day. But at least for this moment in his life, the life of Israel and the history of the saints, he is a forward moving force animated by an unfettered assurance that only faith in God could give you. So be confident in your rich history of answered prayer. Number two, walk by faith, not by sight. Verse 47 says, then all this assembly shall know, this is David speaking to Goliath, that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. 
The Lord doesn't need swords. You know, David would get in trouble with the Lord later in life just for counting his forces, just for counting the men. He thought the men, you ever sit in your house and count your money? <laughs> That's my salvation. I'll put that over there. Um, the Lord's your salvation, not what you've got in the bank and not what you've got on the battlefield. David knew that at this time in his life. To look at the outward appearance of the battlefield that day, there would certainly have been no hope, right? To look at the outward appearance, you'd say, not a chance. For, so, guys, remember this. Um, Saul was one of the biggest guys in Israel. I, whenever I read this, because I already know from the previous chapters that Saul's very big, very handsome, very tall, taller, a head and shoulders over everyone else. I think so, uh, Goliath was taunting Saul. He used his name. It sounded like, the, he's your big man, but look at our big man. Six cubits in a span. I don't know how tall it is. I've heard it's like eight or nine feet or something. <clears throat> so David went out by faith and not by sight, and Goliath went out by sight and not by faith. It's very obvious, right? It's said of Saul that there was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. So he must have looked good on TV when he got elected king. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people, it says, 1 Samuel 9, 2. So Saul himself pointed out David's obvious disadvantage of human strength and resources, and he said, you're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he's been a man of God since his youth. I'm sorry, <laughs> a man of war since his youth. So before we jump headlong here into a false sense of optimism that from time to time masquerades as faith, David wasn't just thinking positively, envisioning beating him. That kind of faith usually ends in disappointment, even destruction. We ought to apply some other biblical principles. First, fear. Faith extinguishes fear, but only because action extinguishes fear. Faith... Friends, you can think a problem to death and be more fearful, fearful the more you consider it. Faith or no faith. It must be a faith of sincere trust in the genuine word of God. A false application of, of godly principles, in fact, led Saul to certain destruction. Saul thought he had faith. Saul knew about a show of repentance. He loved ceremonies. Few religions out there that masquerade as Christian religions who are in love with their ceremonies. They think the ceremonies are their salvation. Saul knew about a show of repentance. He knew about sacrificing to appease a holy God. His insincere application of these principles, however, led Samuel to make this famous statement where Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings? and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, remember this, to obey is better than sacrifice. That's really your second principle. To obey up front is better, better than asking forgiveness on the other side, although that's available to us. To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed, in other words, do what you're told, than the fat of rams, which again is a reference to sacrifice. Rebellion is like witchcraft, he said. Stubbornness is idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Samuel said that to Saul. Saul thought ceremonies. He did exactly the wrong thing, the opposite of what God told him to do in battle with his enemies. And then he tried to make an offering of the things he stole to the God who said, don't touch them. It's not going to work. You, th it's all, you don't even have to have faith to understand that principle, though. I mean, that's reason, isn't it? So what thought, Saul thought could pass for worship and repentance, Samuel exposed as the sin of stubbornness, rebellion, and idolatry. Saul did not proceed from a genuine faith which arises out of a love of God and a desire to please God. 
He saw God as simply a power to bring about his personal wishes. Friends, we have to get beyond that. God isn't just a genie in a lamp. Make three wishes, right? Saul would eventually turn even from this lack of love of God, treating God as though he was some powerful personal sorcerer. Saul would eventually turn to just other regular sorcerers. You may remember the witch of Endor. He would eventually abandon even God for other sorcerers when his personal desires went unmet. See, we have, that's the danger. God didn't answer me. He didn't do what I asked. That's the danger. That's just, all right, you, you thought something, but it wasn't for the glory of God. And so God didn't answer that prayer affirmatively. You thought it was faith, but it wasn't. It's just desire. David did not meet Goliath for personal fame or advantage. He met him for the glory of God, and he made that abundantly known. He meant it for the reputation of God's people. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, he said in verse 46. Those who proceed from genuine faith proceed from the revealed word with knowledge and love of the word. Friends, develop a love of the word, and the only way you can do that is to go into the word until it meets you and feeds you. Paul said this, and he wrote to the Thessalonians, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Why do they perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. You know, sometimes I preach a sermon, many people preach sermons, and someone comes up to them and says, I disagree with that. In fact, so much so, I, I won't be coming around anymore. And my only th answer can be, do you just disagree with it? Or do you think it's not God's word? Because if it's God's word that I've preached, I mean, anyone could tell me, come up and tell me I've made a mistake. You had an improper emphasis on your presentation of God's word. But if you're saying you're preaching God's word, I just don't like it, you don't have a love of the truth. It's a love of the truth, whether it meets our confirmation biases or not. I'm telling you, the media is turning us into people with confirmation bias. We only want to hear what we want to hear, and that's it. And we bring that into the church. But God just doesn't work that way with us. David didn't meet God for personal advantage. And Paul said that people perish because they didn't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, what happens? They descend. God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. I've known and seen people like this even recently who thought for a long time they were Christians and now believe the lie. They receive unrighteous deception and it comes from God. That they all may be condemned who did not believe in the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I'm leaving because I don't believe in a God who condemns. You can go there, but I'd rather you love God's truth and fear the God of truth and develop a faith around that, not around your personal preferences or mine or David's for that matter. Saul was a resistor of authority, both of Samuel's and of God's. He was plagued all his life with terror and disquietude, while David had pleasure in his soul and peace with God. So when we say, as Paul said, we walk by faith, not by sight, we may only be confident when we are obedient. Disobedience will steal your confidence. It should, and it will. Paul goes on to explain, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Whether good or bad. God's word is mild and comforting, and it's harsh and condemning. And we have to receive both aspects of it. 
with love and act in faith. Ver, um, the third principle I have isolated from verse 48 is confront every obstacle head on. And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Don't deny the in inevitable. It's not going away. The Philistine came out 40 days, friends. <laughs> if Saul thought he was going to get tired, he was wrong. He could have been there 80 days if David didn't show up. Establish a godly course, count the cost, proceed toward, toward it with assurance. Most of us would rather not think about the ox obstacle that confronts us. Remember Scarlett O'Hara? I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that today. Or this sermon's from 2003. I also quoted from Orphan Annie. Tomorrow, tomorrow, there's always tomorrow. It's only a day away, something like that. That could be a song of hope or a song of procrastination, depending, <laughs> depending who you are, right? I don't want to pick on little orphan Annie. To believe that tomorrow will bring better things is hope, friends. To believe that tomorrow will remove the obstacles that you're afraid of to confront today is, is resignation. Jesus said sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So don't make up stuff to be fear fearful of. It's not here yet. We live in the present and we act in the present. Longfellow, one of the great poets from this area, right, from Cambridge and Boston, one of my favorite poems, wrote a psalm of life. And the last verse of it is, trust no future, how air pleasant. Because future's a dream, friends. It's not real. Let the dead past bury its dead. He's quoting from Christ there, right? Act, act in the living present, heart within and God o'erhead. Friends, we're present people. We have to act in the present. We don't wish problems away. We act in the problem, in the moment. The circumstance that confronts you today, the circumstances that confront you today are your God-given given reality. The obstacles you circumvent today may simply be accumulated by tomorrow. You know, one thing, there's a couple things that I tell people about sort of self-mastery and trying to trying to walk with God over the long term. And one of them is just priorities. Prioritize your life, your life rightly before God. 90% of the problems people have are mispriorities. You know, God comes first. The worship of God comes first. When we put God first, other things tend to fall in line. You know, our wives, our children. Um, you know, we learn that being obedient to God means making sure our wives and our children, or our husbands and our children, right, are sitting before sound teaching the word of God. So all these things fall into line. The other thing is tasks. Tasks unite us to reality. Imaginations divorce us from reality. Tasks unite us. When you're depressed, you don't do tasks because you're depressed, you don't feel like it. I know the feeling, believe me. I'm not immune to depression. Tasks unite you to reality, and when you don't do them, they add up, and they're still there to haunt you. Then they're overwhelming. I have found in my worst mental and spiritual states that to just have tasks to do brings me out of my lethargy. Tasks are important. They're God-given things that unite us to one another, to our duties before God, and to the reality of things in life. Simple little things. So simple, some of the things I would tell you would sound silly to you. But tasks are important. And I learned that from Jay Adams many years ago. Jay Adams taught that. I'll give you a companion principle to the, to the task thing, and that is thinking can increase fear of action, but action alleviates fear. You don't even have to be a Christian to know that acting, the thinking part's done. You're in the process. The fear goes away. Acting is, you ever have someone like, oh, I can't take this waiting. This waiting is killing me, you know? Acting is much more peaceful than waiting, even when it's difficult. For, for me, it is, and I think that's part of the lesson. 
Some of us think ourselves into spiritual death trying to resolve a situation or dissolve an obstacle without appropriate action. This was Saul's strategy on the battlefield that day. He sat for 40 days, hoping the obstacle would go away, but it kept presenting itself. I almost can't imagine that. 40 days. And every man was afraid, except the man with the faith. Verse, uh, principle number four is use what tools God has provided. Friends, you always have a resource. God will always provide a way of escape. Verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. You know, he could have been at the end of this going, well, no wonder he won. I didn't have a sword. He had a sword. He was bigger than me. He could have done all the complaining, but God gives us resources, and we have them now. You remember Richard III? Anyone know their Shakespeare? <laughs> Richard III was a real guy, but Shakespeare wrote a play about him. He was a bad guy. And at the end, he was losing the battle, the end of the War of the Roses. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. That's like uh, Herod. Um, uh, um, my kingdom for a dance, right? I'll give half my kingdom to the girl, right? So Richard III complained, if I had a horse, things would be different. An Apache warrior has a better strategy. When no horses are available to sweep them away from their troubles, they have a saying, a good horse runs 40 miles, a good Apache can run 70. In the heat of our daily reality, we must learn to be confident in the provision of the Lord for that day, whether it be a strong horse or our own strong legs, right? I told you I pray for parking spaces, and I always get one. Sometimes it's way, way in the back of Walmart, but I have to walk. Bless God. God gave Moses instruction to lead Israel into the desert. He was to say um, that God appeared to him and personally instructed him. Imagine that. You come down from the mountain and you go to your people. And this is what we're going to do because God told me to tell you. I remember a time when Pastor Ken had a story. Pastor Ken was a wealthy man. He owned several businesses, some of which I think are still in business. And people would come to Ken for money. And... He told a story of this uh, young group of guys who heard from God that they were to go up to uh, New Hampshire and buy some land and start a Christian commune. All I can think of is sort of a monastery, Protestant monastery type of thing. And they said to God, to, to God they said to Ken, we need $5,000 and God told us to ask you. That was a million dollars in those days, by the way. And Ken said, that sounds like a great idea. And I'm going to give you the money. All you have to do is get God to tell me. <laughs> That's what Moses was up against, right? Only Moses could really go back to God and say, listen what Moses said. He says to God, suppose they will not believe. Can you imagine asking God to suppose something? Like, like Lord, are you sure you thought this through? Do you know that you don't know these people like I do? Pharaoh's not easy to get along with. Suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said, what's that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses ran away from it. <laughs> it's a good thing Moses was the favorite of God. <clears throat> so God gave Moses a way to prove that he was with God. There were a couple other signs. One was he was to put his hand in his, in his cloak and bring it out and be, it'd be leprous and he'd put it back in it would not be leprous which is obviously you know a miraculous sign or he could throw water on the ground it would become blood um, so God gave him a way to overcome this big supposition that he presented now I reference this so that we'll see that God does not need to go far to find things that convince us of his existence Moses had a rod he had a hand he had a bucket of water What's that in your hand, he said. 
And the person to whom he's talking can see that his faith was close to him all along. It begins with what is in our hand, the immediate provision of God, which faith reveals to us. You know, when God made man, he didn't go far from materials, did he? <laughs> he said, well, here's some dirt. I'll make them out of that. God doesn't need stuff, friends. Remember Gideon? I bet you haven't read Gideon for a while. He came with a company of 300 to take over the Midianites. The Midianites were well armed. Gideon and his men didn't have any swords. He had a thousand men, but God said, that's too many. I want less. I want fewer. I want fewer. I want fewer. They got down to 300. And we read this from Judges chapter 7. They held torches in their left hand. This was at night. And trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. You know, just the word sword scared away the Midianites. They didn't even have to see the swords. Just men coming out, bluffing, just like Goliath. It was a big bluff, right? We love to cite the success of others by noting their obvious provisional advantages. How often have you said this? Well, what do you expect? He had money. I don't have money. He has money. No wonder he can do that. Or his father has connections. You know, my father doesn't. All the while, we're not cognizant of what we're saying. We're noting the provisions of someone else and believing these are the only provisions that can get results. Right? Rather than coveting the swords of others, we ought to become skillful with the sling that's in our hand. Each may have a different tool, but each may have a different obstacle as well. The most precious tool you have is faith, yet you're choosing to walk by jealousy or fear or morbid introspection rather than in thankfulness. You know thankfulness is great power before God? It brings contentment, and contentment says to God, I'm blessed with what you've given me, and I've become less whiny about what I need. And we're allowed to whine to our Father, all right? But thankfulness is much more powerful. Being content. Thankfulness with contentment is great gain, Paul said, I think, to Titus. So each may have a different tool, but each may have a different obstacle. There's but a handful of things in this world that cannot be solved by hard work and godly determination. I think that was uh, Clint Eastwood in Pale Rider that said that. But um, I remember I wrote this in 2003. Now, I actually, the other night, Thursday night Bible study, some of you were there, I, I was wondering aloud where I should take the sermon series, right? Remember we were talking? I said, I'd love to go on to Solomon, but David's so rich, I, I got to talk more about David. So it's a series on the long line of faithful people who stood for godly purpose purposes at great personal risk. It's a good thing that I should use the biographies of these saints as examples to illustrate certain principles of faith. And so to resolve my quandary, I wondered, what do I have in my hand? Which way should I go? Well, one thing I have is an old sermon. Old sermons are really all I have. And the only thing wrong with old sermons is they haven't been preached in a while. You ever notice you can go in a person's house and they can have a lot of books on a shelf, but it doesn't make them smart. They have to actually read those books to become smart. I mean, it's a view, you never notice when they interview smart guys on TV, there's books behind them. They always have a couple showing so you know where they, you know, where they stand or if they wrote one, it's there. But they probably didn't even read those books. What do you actually have in your hand? Well, I have old sermons. And as you know, we write them out, and we, we keep them, and we keep them hard copy. And I knew of this, so I said to Karen, remember the lion and the bear? I know I preached it a long time ago. I don't know when. Go online, because that's her job. That's what's in her toolbox. And find the lion and the bear, and she found it. And she said, it's badly formatted. It's not up to our current ways of doing it. Because I had one of those old computers where it was that long from front to back. Remember those? And the screen was this big? And the computer was there. <laughs> um, but she found it, and the lion and the bear, and it was from 2003. And I think there's some sound principles there for us to emulate in our faith walk with God, so I went back to that. Um, number five, do not believe the reports of the enemy. 
Verse 44 said, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give you a flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields. Friends, if you believe the report of the enemy, the battle is already over. Right? That's what the media keeps trying to do to us in political things. They try to make us see the battle's already over, so quit. Here's a, re a reality that is seldom looked at from this passage. Certainly the Israelites are afraid to offer a man to challenge Goliath. That's obvious, right? Yet it seems to me that the whole army of the Philistines were as afraid as Israel. Why didn't they attack? I mean, both armies are stifled, right? Why did they not attack if they were confident? They weren't confident either. They couldn't have been. They never would have stayed there 40 days, looking at them across the chasm, right? It seems to me the whole Goliath challenge from a military standpoint is one gigantic bluff. We have a better chance with one-on-one -on -one than we do fighting those guys. In regards to application of this principle, however, we must be discerning as to who is the enemy. David had to field opposition from a whole range of enemies. Goliath won. What about Saul? Saul tried to talk him out of it. What about Eliab, his older brother, who he should have been able to trust? But he was so full of envy, he couldn't trust him. Friends, in the spiritual realm, these are the enemies. Friends and family even can be enemies. Jesus said it, right? And not come to bring, bring peace but a sword, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. And mother will be against daughter, and father against son, and so on, he goes. David had to find a way to resist the advice of king and countrymen and to reject the counsel of his oldest brother. Now, don't jump off on this and say, Dan told us not to listen to our loved ones. <laughs> All right? You may remember Moses got good advice from his unsaved father-in-law, Jethro who said, there's a million people here. You can't run them all by yourself. You need to appoint judges. And so the whole appellate court system was designed by Jethro. And he gets credit, by the way, historically. Sometimes they're right. Friends, sometimes an unsaved person has really good advice if he loves you and, is, and has had some of his own trials. So what you need is discernment. All right? We need discernment. We have to consider that Eliab... The older brother, rejected by Samuel for anointing in chapter 16, right, was probably filled with jealousy and rage. He was, he was jealous of David, the younger brother, because he got anointed and he didn't. Now, he has to face his brother's optimism in the face of his obvious fear. I'm going to tell you, the brothers aren't mentioned anymore after this chapter, if I remember correctly. They fade away. Saul was in a bind. He had to accept David's offer. Right? His advice was useless. David's success, however, would be begrudged by Saul the rest of his life. Saul was a bad counselor. He almost would have done better if David failed. His envy would, in fact, be his total spiritual destruction. A person who envies you is not a good counselor. A person who begrudges your optimism or success or good fortune may not be a good counselor. If he can't rejoice in your success and your good fortune, probably not a good counselor, probably envious. Envy's always there. Such a person may not even be an intentional enemy, but their counsel is tainted by their sin. It's my experience that people of God are really quite inept in determining profitable sources of counsel. That's something we need to work on and develop. Discernment. The more you know of God's word, you know, the more you know how to discern, discern good counsel from bad. Like Saul, we tend to choose the counselor who tells us what we want to hear rather than what God has said. Confirmation bias. It's nothing new. I'll end with this. Number six, be skeptical of the devices of the world. Right? We don't do things the way they do. Verse 39. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. Because Saul was big and David was small at this point in his life. He was probably 14 or 16 or something 
little skinny kid, right? So David said to Saul, I can't walk with these, for I've not tested them. They needed an editor. You didn't have to say that twice. So David took them off. In other words, friends, thanks but no thanks, he said to Saul. Saul, it seems to me, wanted his armor to win the day, with or without him in it. Did you ever think of that? Had he won in Saul's armor, Saul's armor would have been set up and worshipped in Israel, right? The king's armor took down Goliath. So God wasn't about to let the armor do the fighting. Instead, the only thing to be exalted before them was the childlike faith of a sheep herder. Faith uses different weapons than flesh, friends. Men say fight fire with fire. God says a soft word turns away wrath. Men say avenge every wrong. God says do not return evil for evil. Right? It sounds like the Sermon on the Mount here, right? You have heard it said, but I say. It's often the case that a man must reject conventional wisdom in order to put his faith into action. If a man cannot walk, friends, how can he fight? If we wish to fight godly battles, we cannot do it by worldly strategies. Our personal trials, our past deliverances, our unseen assurance, our sense of duty, our sincere desire to bring glory to God will never fail us. Father, bless us today with discernment, a discernment that can only come from faith in Christ and a love of truth. Thy word is truth. Amen.